Hi, and welcome back to another issue of Sprue Talk. Today, I'm joined by Matt, uh, oh, yeah. our design manager, and uh, Paramjit, a senior designer for Airfix. Welcome. Thank you for joining me to go today, guys. Cheers, thank you. Right <laughs> out. <laughs> So um, I know uh, you guys are particularly busy working on 2023 and 24 projects now, which we obviously can't go into. Um, but today we thought we'd um, we'd discuss the new starter set products that have, have come out into the range uh, over the last couple of years now, I believe, um, and how they are um, different to our classic kits. Um, so and, and let you guys, the viewers, um, understand the, the differences in, in those kits because they are available in both starter sets and classic um, and, and why those uh, differences exist. So I guess we'll start off by saying that we've found every one of our products in the starter set range and we put it on the table in front of us, haven't we? And the only thing that's duplicated well, is the tanks and the, the Hawk and the Spitfires that, that are, are duplicated. Um, apparently you wanted to show off the uh, the undercarriage of the uh, aircraft, didn't you? So you brought those in. Yeah, just to sort of show that you can both do user stand and have it undercarriage down. And the shadow stands. And we'll cover the shadow stands uh, in, a, in a bit. Um, I'm not too sure who's designed what, actually. So I guess let's start off by, by sort of naming and not shaming um but um just sort of covering off um who designed who designed what so apparently i know you designed the spitfire yep hawk yeah hawk and tiger tank okay yeah matt uh, so i'll be working on the cars um my colleague chris upstairs he did the mary rose yep. um and the sherman was done by our ex-colleague tom yeah yeah yep. if tom if you're watching i hope you're doing well <laughs> Um, well, okay, thanks. So, um, the one of the first kits to be released uh, under the new starter set range was the the uh, the tanks and the Spitfire and Hawk, weren't mm. they? And I don't know what order they were released in. Are you guys enlightening me? Uh, Tiger tank, and then the Sherman tank was briefs uh, shortly after that. Yeah. And then I done the Hawk, and then I done the Spitfire starter set. Cool. And then the cars obviously are um, coming. Um, coming out this year, um, the Bugatti Chiron is already available, uh, and then the Pagani and E Type are, are sort of on their way. So, uh, and the Mary Rose is uh, available now as well. So, I guess let's start off by saying, you know, why was the, the decision made to take a slightly different approach with the design uh, of the starter sets when we've never done that before? Uh, Matt, come on. Um, well, this. Um, project was started um, a few years, few years ago, really. Um, obviously, realised that starter sets are kind of a, a new modeler. Um, it's most likely going to be their first contact with Airfix. Um, certainly, when we've been doing make and paint events at big model shows and air shows, um, some of the older kits that were being used in starter sets aren't necessarily the easiest to put together. Um, some of the molds are worn. Um, they show their age a bit. Um, so we wanted to make sure that um, a modeler's first experience was with a nice modern kit, um, design it so that it's easier to put together, um, so that you're more likely to get a really satisfying end result and something you can be really proud of, um, even if you haven't sort of built up all of your modeling skills yet. Um, so yeah, we sort of made sure that all the parts locate together nicely. Some of it's simplified, but you still end up with something that's an accurate shape and something that um, will look great on the shelf. Yeah, uh, I know that's key for us, and, and something that the, you know we work really hard on is ensuring that that first experience of modelling, uh, be that to a child or an adult later, uh, is is you know the best it can be. Whether it's in a controlled environment during one of our making making paint events uh, here at our visitor centre when they're running the events, or all the various clubs and organisations that we work with. Um, apparently, do you remember when you first built a kit? How old were you? Do you remember that? No, I must have been below ten. I've done a couple of models here and there. Yeah. And and do you remember who introduced you to it? You, I, I can't imagine you sat there on your own and did it. We, we, yeah, I think I did. You did? Yeah. You just decided, well, that's what I want to do? And Yeah, but I've kind of done it at a young age, then went off it. 
and then we've told this story before but when i went to san diego in california yeah um that's doesn't, when i saw doesn't like to brag yeah <laughs> this is when i saw the uss midway yeah and then i was like oh, i want to build an aircraft carrier when i came back and i ended up buying a 1350 uss nimitz which is like completely um, wrong thing to do yeah, with yeah. the start set so obviously when i was doing that these sort of products would obviously help in that so it basically like builds up your skills builds up your confidence yeah. to obviously go and do something more complicated um so it's just one of those things but yeah the tiger was the first one because we done that somewhat interesting story about the tiger and the spitfire we'll go on a bit I'll go on about it in a bit but the tiger was done as one tool for both of the starter set and the classic range yes yeah, so we'll cover that yeah. off and, and how you split the yeah. split the parts I'll ask the same question to you, Matt. Do you remember the first kit you built and how you got into modelling? Yeah, um, I mean, my, my dad used to make models when he was uh, younger um, with my uncle. Um, so I remember sitting, I must have been about seven or eight, um, and I think it was actually a match, Matchbox Gloucester Meteor, um, followed by an Airfix Harrier, I think it was a 48 scale one. Um, but they, yeah, they were great, great kits because they were kind of, they were quite simple. Um, but and they're very much off their time. But it was kind of quite a nice introduction to modelling because it wasn't too, um, it wasn't too complex. You know, they the kind of chunky parts and they sort of, they go together sort of where they fit. But you can you still make something that looks like a yeah. an aeroplane. But no, yeah. it's it good times. We had our um, model railway up in the loft and uh, used to sit and make models in our little workshop in the attic. So yeah, it was good times. And you could go back. <laughs> Um, I think my dad introduced me to modelling many moons ago. He used to do it when he was a kid. So, um, yeah, he got me into it. And then I ended up just sitting down the shed and building three uh, 35th scale tanks and, and stuff. And that was me, really. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, now we work here and I don't do any modelling. So uh, it's not a good sign, is it? <laughs> um so that yeah, that first experience of any modeler is really key, um, and as you said, Matt, and, and quite rightly so, that's why this was um, really important for us to get right. Um, you know, and historically, Airfix has had a, a, a range of starter sets or, or gift sets with paints, glues, brushes, etc., yep. as well as the plastic, uh, because you can't expect any beginner to go off and buy, you know. Uh, all the paints and glues and you know it likely cost twice as much just for for that material as yeah. it would the initial kit and so that's why we do that um but um okay so the uh, let's go into the the design of of the kits and how that differs um and matt i know you was involved in the spitfire you've, you've designed a number of spitfires here during your time um and apparently i guess this was you know your first your first Spitfire. Yeah. Um, so you're both in, involved and have shared data, uh, etc. on it. So how did how how does this project start? Is it any different to the classic kit that we've got in the in, in the range, or did they start off as the, the, the same as the same CAD, and at some point you you split it off and one became a classic, one became a, a, a starter set? So yeah, sort of going onto the Tiger Tank. Um, as I was saying, the Tiger Tank was done as a starter set and a classic one, both on the same tooling, but something that was a lot more simpler um, due to the shape and everything like that. But then when I got once that project was completed, um, I was given the brief for both the Hawk and Spitfire at the same time. Normally you get one project at a time, but obviously I got the brief for both of them at the same time. And the main thing was because of the stand and trying to make them quite similar mm -hmm. in terms of making it really simple. Um, so done one project at a time, done the Hawk first, then moved on to the Spitfire. And I remember um, Martin, um, development manager, he said, um, let's see whether you can do the same thing how you've done on the Tiger Tank, because obviously it makes it easier in terms of tooling and trying to get that through as you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got a Tiger Tank in here so yeah. much. So let's, let's start with Tiger then. Um, how does how does that differ from um, you know if you were brief to do a, a just sort of a standard classic kit? Does the shape and everything is still the way you get to the basic shape is still the same? Surely, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the skeleton model and everything was the same. The shape and everything is the same. It was the idea of 
the most complicated thing on the tank is the tracks. How do you make the tracks um, simple yep. um, for someone who doesn't really do it and sort of look down at the wargaming aspect because a lot of people like to um, build accurate uh, sort of tanks that are very simple. So one thing is that the tank tracks are like one piece. Yeah. Um, obviously for this one, it wasn't really possible. It was possible for the Sherman to do it as one piece. Um, well, it was sort of one piece on the Tiger, but just in two halves, just because it becomes too thick yeah. to obviously do it in one piece. But with the Sherman, it's like half the width of the Tiger tank because the Tiger is such a big beast. And that's that's different because the, you know, and these are 72nd scale, we should mention that, but mm -hmm. the, um, you know, historic range of AFVs on the fighting vehicles in 76th scale have largely had sort of rubber band tracks, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. Matt's had, they're not the easiest things to try and... Um, no, I mean, it's a sort of vinyl, you sort of end up, you can't glue it, so people end up using staples or bits of cotton to try and tie them on, and it's it's not... They don't. They, they never look right, and it's not a great experience. So we wanted to simplify that, um, so that um, you that you don't need to start using sort of different methods and techniques to to try and lash things. Yeah, <laughs> sort of uh, make it work. I remember in um, it could have been our instructions, but um, I've certainly seen it in plastic modelling instructions where it says to heat the you know the the flat side of a screwdriver yeah. over yeah. a candle or a, yeah, or a lighter very, until you know then you, health and safety and then you melt it these days. The, yeah yeah i'm not sure i'd give the uh, you know an 8 year old a, a lighter and a screw screwdriver and say mm. just heat that up over there <laughs> and then um, you know one one of the key things with the tracks is that because um, it's vinyl you need like a super glue or something like that which is obviously something we don't provide in the box so what we want to try and do is everything that you get in the box you can use to build your kit yeah. So obviously with the vinyl tracks, it, I'm not I'm not going to lie, it was a lot easier doing the vinyl tracks because it's just quite a simple thing for me to do. But in terms of the long term uh, game and uh, sometimes you got to like put the consumer first. Yeah. Well, and that's then, exactly where this product it, it, this product range is, isn't it? It's yeah. putting all of our products products are putting the consumer first. But in, in terms of this, it is led by the beginner. Yeah. Uh, let me open this bag because it's going to be really loud on the mic. So uh, I don't want to try and do it when um, you guys are talking. So you guys want to explain how that, um, how this, these frames differ to the classic kit? Yeah. So there's actually two extra frames in the Tiger tank for the classic kit. For the classic set yeah and those are the more complicated tracks um, where the individual uh, wheels are more or less uh, been given so here you can see it's all molded on yeah and the tracks are obviously molded on so it makes it a bit more difficult for painting but for the beginner that's not that big of a deal because obviously brush painting and the main goal of a starter set is to first put the kit together yeah i mean like if once you get past that hurdle then work on the painting stage after that yeah you don't need to glue every individual yeah will have on exactly um, and then the track links and everything else to get a feel for modeling do yeah. you you know just by by doing it in these two halves mm. and finishing the kit quicker um hopefully more enjoyable uh, from a beginner's point of view and then you can get onto painting which is which is you know uh, yeah. the other the other element of, of the joy of the, the hobby i mean one thing i always say to people is that um, buy a kit. I mean, like they say, they don't want to really get into it because it's a lot of um, they're scared of it. Mm. I mean, like you can get quite scared of it in terms of when you look at the materials and resources that you need. Um, but I always say to people, just put the kit together, and you don't have to paint if you don't want to. Just get a rattle can if you wanted to, but just get past that first stage and see um, how much you enjoy it and uh, get a taste of the obviously um, what subjects you like. I mean, like now we've got four different um, nice subjects, whether you like tanks, do you like tanks, do you like cars, do you like aircraft, do you like ships? Yeah. It just get past that first hurdle of building the kit and then see where, where it takes you. Yeah, yeah. I must admit, that's why I always, I always did tanks because quite a lazy painter. Yeah. Just, just lots of green. <laughs> lots, of, <laughs> lots of green, lots of um, sand and a, and a rattle can, basically. And if you make any mistakes, just stick some mud on it. Yeah, whack some mud <laughs> on it. And uh, thanks very much. And, you know, PVA, mix some PVA glue up, some dried mud from the garden, 
It looks like wet mud when it's dry. Uh, thanks very much. I'm, <laughs> I'm off to do my next kit. Yeah. So, um, so there's three sprues in the Tiger One um, kit, starter set kit. Mm -hmm. And you said there's another two frames. Yeah, so the two frames are for the tracks and there's some cables um, that go on it. So what I've done is done it as optional parts okay. and you just basically drill out holes underneath and then you can locate it on top. And they're the sort of uh, tow ropes, metal tow ropes that, uh, yeah. that the tigers and, and most tanks tend to. Yeah, uh, so you can see it there. Like that's where you just sort of drill out the holes um, okay. for the uh, cable tires and stuff like that and the tow ropes. Yeah. Um, didn't want to put that in there just because it's slightly um, a bit more fragile, yeah. shall we say? Yeah, yeah. So um, they're putting it together. You've put some guide holes on the underside. Yeah. Um, so when you look at the top, if you don't want to put those on, you can't see them, of course. Yeah. And actually the gun barrel as well was attached to the little mount here. So it was done as one piece, whereas the more complicated one, the gun barrel is a separate part, just so you can get some of that detail on there. Oh, okay. So that's, that, that's this is the uh, the sort of hole mounted MG, isn't it? Yeah. The um, not the um, the main gun, but mm. uh, I mean, like you want to try and reduce the amount of small parts. Sometimes it's necessary just because of the nature of the subject or whatever. But you want to try and, um, for example, like on Spitfire, um, added the aerial to this little uh, detail bit there, just so the part is slightly bigger. Yeah. I know um, we aim it as kit for kids or people who are introduced back into the hobby but making something a bit more bigger and more manageable is always um, a plus yeah yeah and sim so, sim sorry similarly yeah. on the the sherman some of the um finer details yeah. on the front of the hull um they actually go in from underneath so you've got like a nice chunky um yeah. almost like block underneath yeah. so it's it's less likely to snap them or lose them and they they slot inside yeah and just poke out the top, so you still get your sort of relatively fine detail, but it's a lot easier to put together. Yeah, also, it doesn't matter if you, you know, if you whack a load too much glue on or, or whatever. Yeah, because that's all hidden on the inside. Can't see it. Yeah. yeah. So then, with the classic kit, just you know, talking, we're covering starter sets off, but as the the toolings for most of these items, uh, the tools are shared across the classic. Kits. There's another two frames uh, in the classic, which you mentioned, and they're all the individual individual wheels, but not individual track links. Surely, surely not. They are sections um, of yeah, sections of not all individual ones. I know um, some competitor ones do individual track links, but I thought that was way too complicated. Maybe in thirty fifth scale, yeah, not for seven seconds. Second. Second. No, um, but what I actually did as well is that the back ones on the Tiger they're all joined just because you don't really see that even on the classic kit but then the front ones are individual just so you get that depth of field because there's like four different rows of wheels yeah so that was quite a key thing i know that was quite a, a thing when they were actually being used during the second world war is you know if they had a problem with with a bearing on one of the wheels at the back they had to take like two sets yeah, off exactly. at the front to eventually get to it and it's not yeah we used to clock up with mud yeah not the yeah. most ideal thing to have to try and deal with when you're um when you're out in the field somewhere mm. so they the, the the tigers molded in this sand color um they're all molded in um various colors aren't they matt so what was the method of thinking behind that um so it's almost to act like a almost like a base color for the main color that the model is going to be painted um so the the tigers in the sand color um the cars are molded in um colors that are similar to the top coat um, that you're going to be painted it in. Yeah, um, down there. So this is the. Uh, so that's the um, the little Bugatti. So that's going to be in a black and red um, color scheme. Um, so the red color is just so it makes the um, the red paint a bit more vibrant like when you paint it on. Yeah. And and also you know as I mentioned earlier, half of modeling is is actually assembling. The plastic and then i always think anyway the other half is 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 painting and, and getting into bringing it to life but of course for a beginner regardless of age and i can't stress that enough um you know maybe it's just they're not confident to to do the painting so they want to just build yeah uh, and then they but by molding it in the colors of course they don't have to paint yet no yet they still have a a really good looking uh model on there 
on their shelf. And then at the later stage, of course, they could go back and, and apply some paint yeah, once they become a little bit more confident with yeah. it. And then the, um, I don't know what else you've got in your box of tricks down there, Matt. The, um, I can't remember what we brought brought down with us. The Spitfire is moulded in, in our standard grey. Yeah. Um, the Sherman and the Tiger on here are, are their base colours. The Pagani is in blue, I believe. And then the E-Type will be in, in green. Green, yeah. Um, and then the Red Arrow is, the Red Arrow Hawk is all, is all moulded in, in yeah. red, isn't it? So... And I've got a feeling the the little ship is moulded in. I think it's a, a brown or sand colour. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it could be the same as the tiger, actually. Oh, oh, if my memory serves me correctly. Yeah. So Matt, let's talk cars then, because I know this is a little little pet project of, yeah. of yours. Um, they're a different scale, the forty third scale, which is I was going to say new for Airfix, but it. Actually, it isn't new for Airfix, is it? We've done 43rd scale before where we've partnered with various businesses over the years. Yeah, so for 1 to 43rd scale is an established car model is scale. Um, I think um, Heller in the past had a really nice range. Um, it also goes nicely with um, Corgi diecast cars, the um, Vanguards, 1 to 43rd, and also O-Gage model railways is 1 to 43rd. So yeah. it's um, it's a nice scale. You get an, um, it's, it's not too big so that... Um, we can keep the price down and but at the same time you can get you can fit a lot of detail in there you know, so all the cars they've got a, for for a low parts count they've got quite a lot of detail i've got like all the seats dashboard inside um got quite nice detailed wheels um so yes yeah, it's, it's a nice it's a nice scale to work in yeah and they're not uh, you know, too dissimilar to the, the two seventy second scale tanks in terms of size. Exactly, yeah. Which for us, price point wise, is is great. Um, you know, because as you as you mentioned, trying to keep the retail price point as low as possible for these is really key. Because at the end of the day, they're they're a beginner product. Um, so keeping them around that sort of twelve uh, pounds, uh, that sort of between ten and twenty pounds mark, is is ideal for us. Um, and then, you know, of course, it's where we can then place them in the market, which is the the next uh, the next hurdle. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, which one did you design, Matt? Because so I designed all three of the cars. Okay. Um, and we've got some more in the pipeline. Um, the first one I worked on was the Bugatti, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the fastest, if not the fastest, production car in the world. I think. Um, so yeah, it was the first time I'd worked on a car after years of aircraft. Um, and it was actually based on original CAD data from Bugatti themselves. So it, the shape is as authentic as you're going to get. Um, same with the Pagani. The Jaguar, we actually um, laser scanned a um, full-size E-Type. So again, the shape is as hopefully captured the sort of distinctive Jaguar e type shape as, as well as we can. Yeah, is the la is laser scanning different to three D scanning? Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Um, because I, I've seen some footage where uh, some guys are sort of scanning a vehicle, but it's on a robotic arm or something. Um, yeah. So we that's, there's lots of different methods. Um, we we use the same equipment that we'd used for, for scanning an aircraft or a military vehicle. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was. Uh, Fun day out, laying on our vintage Jaguars for your day. Yeah, I bet, I bet. And uh, you know, having the um, the original manufacturer's CAD, I know is, is, I mean, that's what a head start that gives us. Yeah, it, it can be a bit of a double edged sword because you want to put every single little last detail in, but obviously we're trying to keep it simple, so you have to sort of rein it in a little bit, and <laughs> so you don't have loads and loads of little parts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hopefully we've we've captured the. The look and feel of these sort of amazing automotive automotive machines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they they do look lovely. Um, I remember we uh, many moons ago we were sent the CAD data for Bentley Continental GT. Mm -hmm. I think Sky Electric were doing something. Yeah. It. And um, that 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 CAD data package. It took them days to open up on our machines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it included the you know the the CAD data for the sunglasses case. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, all, all, yeah, the umbrella was in there. Everything was in there. So, you know, yeah, it must take some unpicking. On on the 
the CAD package for the Pagani, it actually included the ignition key. Well, because the ignition key is in the shape of a, a Pagani and you plug it into the dashboard. Well, wow. that, was, that was quite impressive. That is really cool. Is there anything that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, need to watch out for on these or it, they are literally just pretty much clip and go, aren't they? You know, you need a little bit of glue here and there, but I know that yeah. the example we've got on the table here will, will pretty much clip together. Yeah. So what, one of the things I wanted to include was, um, you don't have to put any glue on the clear part. So that just clips in place. So you don't have to risk sort of getting sort of gluey fingerprints and smudges on your, on your glass, keep it nice and clear. Um, so you, you get your body shell, um, which builds up from two or three pieces. Um, and then it, quite nice detailed interior, but in reality, it's only four or five parts. Um, it pretty much just clips, clips in place. Um, and then your sort of chassis with your suspension um, built up on it. Again, it's only about four or five parts um, and you sort of quite quickly build up a um, nice little model. Put your wheels on and away you go. Yeah, yeah it, is a, it is a lovely little kit. Looking forward to the other two coming out into the market. I know the Jag's just... Um, no, the Pagani's just about to land, but uh, we've got limited stock, so we're having to manage that one a little bit carefully. But um, no, thanks for that, Matt. And then um, on the aircraft, let's go back over to you, Paramjit, with the aircraft. Um, the shadow stands, let's cover those off because they have uh, they were covered in the TV programme, weren't they? The Hornby Model World TV programme. Mm. And, um, you know, they're, they're quite different. We've not done shadow stands before. So how did the shadow stand come about? Um, that's uh, so Martin obviously and the guys gave me the brief and they said oh you need to do design a stand um, or they said they didn't really they just said a stand so it was more or less up to me yeah. what to do so I was like okay and to be honest I already seen a build by someone who um, uh, uh, Mr. Phil Flory he'd done yeah. his one and that was like maybe about six months before so this is 2018 2019 so i started in 2018 um so probably about 2019 around about there and he'd done a shadow stand and i thought to myself well that would now that i've seen that no when you see something and you can't get that out of your head so you're like now that you need to do a stand and it just sort of coincided like, it was just a coincidence that um i saw that and obviously i was given a brief for us yeah. a, a shadow stand or a stand so then i was like okay um do one in the shape of the shadow of the aircraft i've actually done a few other ones so wasn't got to do with the shadow stand and it was like night and day everyone just basically went shadow stand, shadow stand. yeah and we had actually a lot of refinement onto these as well so looking at them now and then looking at the earlier iterations of the, sh the shadow stand um this one like beats it hands down but it was like i remember it was like about five millimeters thick mm. it was quite big um it's on here, isn't it? Actually, yeah. But the, the, the yeah, the earlier ones were actually like literally about two or three times the thickness of it. Oh wow! Because obviously you don't really know until, and obviously I'm a new designer as well, so you don't really know mm. how big it needs to be mm. for it to take the weight before it like tips over or yeah. something like that. So you over-engineered it, and then we were, were yeah. able to sort of yeah. cut it back. As I it mean, was. like we refined it <clears> as well. I remember we had like several meetings. Um, so I think the projects were done separately, but then the stands were done at the same time. So that's another unique thing. So I remember doing the Hawk first, completing that, and then doing the Spitfire, moving on to that, and then doing the stands for both of them at the same time, just so that they they feel like as if they've been done together rather than um, one's been done first and then other one's like an afterthought mm. or something like that. Yeah. So that was a key thing. The Hawk is actually, I think, probably my favorite just because the way it goes into the rear of the aircraft, you can sort of pose it, whereas the Spitfire needed to go underneath. Um, but we also had a lot of refining because we ended up um can't yeah. remember who's i do like that yeah it uh, just i really like the fact that you can just tilt it like that you went through a few different versions of like using the the tail fin to sort of blend up yeah. into the, the stand yeah which i mean that's like, really really well we, we had even different uh, designs and shapes of this as well there was so much stuff but originally this was all completely flat and then we started adding like the intakes and stuff like that. But then you, there was a fine balance as well because you just don't want to make it 
exactly like another aircraft but just flowing flying beneath it mm. so we haven't got like the canopy panel lines or anything like that. just like the rough shape of it with the intake and uh, the fuselage same with that as well so just the fuselage bit and then obviously adding the fx logo to it as in as an emboss so you can put a wash through it or something like that to pick it out and make sure it's like ha almost have your right name and name on it yeah and uh, there are there are two part stands aren't they yeah two parts so that's that's all that's included but these the shadow stands stands aren't included in the classic kits are they it's no. only starter sets yeah so on the on the Spitfire, the Mark Five C, C is a Mark Five C, isn't it? Yeah, Mark Five C. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In my head, I was Mark Five B, but that was the old starter set yeah. um, that we used to have. So the Mark Five C. Um, so you designed the CAD for that, the shape and everything. Let's just go back to the beginning of the Spitfire. Um, and yeah, well, I know we've got tons and tons of Spitfire data here in the business <laughs> over the years. So you designed the CAD for that. At what point did you did you split that or, or didn't you? How, how did that happen? Yeah, so it was a bit of a unique um, uh, process. Yeah. Just because, so done the Hawk. So first project was obviously the Tiger Tank. Yep. Then the Hawk. Um, then the Spitfire, but the Spitfire kind of wanted it to be my first project using the surfacing. So if anyone knows that sort of CAD design, surface and modeling is like the hardest part and that's like the part you need to perfect to obviously do this job correctly. Um, and obviously not having having experience on CAD work, but not too much surfacing work and obviously un understanding the software. So we actually use the 40 f scale um, data, which we were originally gonna, always going to use but I ended up using the skeleton model, almost like scan data, and then building across it. So I wasn't just using those shapes and stuff. I wasn't just using that data. Um, I was actually rebuilding it just so um, I'm learning something. You're tracing over. Yeah. You, you sort of rescaled the 48 scale. Yeah. Uh, CAD data, albeit taking all the little bits off it, and, yeah. then, and then started to trace over it with yeah. your own surfacing. Yeah. And then obviously understanding what area, then at that point you understand what areas need to be simplified, what can be removed, and obviously more or less everything in the cockpit need to be removed other than the seat. Okay. Um, just because you want to focus on the exterior of the aircraft. I mean, like, if you put that uh, Spitfire with the classic Spitfire and ask people to tell the difference, obviously without the stand coming out of it, um, you'll be hard-pressed to, to know uh, what the differences, is, differences are uh, other than the build process. Um, so it's one of those ones where you use that skeleton model as a basis and yeah. then build upon that. And then um, sort of going back, that was a quite a long winded bit to get to the That's part. Okay. Um, I know they're not five minute projects. So, yeah. so. <laughs> and then I designed the starter Spitfire and then the way the CAD system works is that you can insert areas. So I made copies of it and then copied it over into the classic one. Okay. But then I had to do it at points where uh, I hadn't added too much detail or made location for areas that don't exist. So as I was going before, um, not adding the location on the fuselages for the cockpit, but I needed to do it for the classic one. Um, so it was at that point. And then there were points when I went on to the, so the starter, one, starter set was completely done. And then I moved on to the uh, classic one. Yeah. And then that's when I just ever so slightly started tweaking it. But the reason was ideally in an ideal situation, we wanted to do it as a tiger tank. But then I quite quickly said to Martin within the project. When you say like a tiger tank, I, you've got the fuselage is the common tool and then there's extra parts to it. Yeah, it's similar to that. So like it's basically in one tool. But whereas these Spitfires, they're treated as two separate projects, whereas the tiger tank is almost treated as one project. Yeah. Because obviously when you do all your paperwork and all yeah when i do all the fun capex and run the numbers exactly yeah that this is all the tiger tank is treated as one project but you can get two um different products out of it yeah whereas this one you only get one product out of each one but the reason is because um you get too many compromises and too much restriction on if you try to do it as one tool i'm it, it will be close to an impossible task yeah so one project one product it, it's like no product is good at either one so the classic one isn't good at a starter set uh, sorry the classic one isn't good as a classic set and the starter set isn't good as a starter yeah, set yeah, yeah. You, you've got an in-between of it but they're both so far apart from their 
intended uh, audience. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what's um, you you mentioned the cockpit detail of the um, starter set yeah. here um, is is missing all bit the uh, the seat. actual seats, yeah. which is is here, and it includes a pilot for those modellers that um, love including a pilot. Um, what else is different? Um, I think in terms of the yeah. I think, yeah, I think, sorry, I think my probably favourite part is probably the canopy. So sort of going back how you were saying, talking about yeah, the cockpit, box, yeah. is that it actually, um, yeah, you can see there, there's a little tab there, so you don't actually need any glue. So you can just sort of slot it in, and it goes into the rear of the, just behind the fuselage, and then just pops in. Yeah, so just under this aerial, yeah. it just slots in. So exactly. again, you know, I guess that's similar to the Bugatti, and you, yeah. you, you were really conscious on the clear parts. Because I know you get frosting if you use mm. too much of our glue or just a little bit in the wrong place, then it sort of ruins the whole clear part. Mm. So that's very clever. And did that design um, improvement, if you like, carry over to the Classic or does the Classic kit not include Classic this? one doesn't include that just because, again, it goes back to that thing where you would have made too It's hard to do that for both sets of uh, toolings. So hence why they got split off the projects yeah. at that point. Um, but also the reason why you don't need, some people might probably criticise, oh, why don't you add a bit more cockpit detail? But the thing is, there's no open canopy on this one, it's only enclosed. Yeah. So the amount of detail you see isn't going to be as much. And again, going back to the audience, um, audience wants a Spitfire. They want the shape of it. They just want to get there as quickly as possible. Um, so you don't need to worry about the other uh, stuff that enthusiasts will worry about. That's why there's a classic one. Yeah, yeah. And I know that um, in terms of the, some of the design differences is that the exhausts for the starter set are moulded as part of this sort of top cowling, is that the white, white frame? Whereas the classic, they're separate pieces, aren't they? Again, fiddly parts. So that's why they were molded in as part of that larger larger part. Yeah, and it's also so that it makes it easier just to put together, and obviously you try and reduce the part count so that it's not so much of an intimidating build. Yeah, um, and then the tail wheel is another part that is molded in the starter set, um, and then um, and then a separate mold. piece. Yeah. Just little stuff like that, and obviously the propeller and spinner is obviously separate. Oh, I didn't. Know, do you know what? I've, I've not noticed that. I've built a few of these, yeah. and I've, I've not noticed that. Um, you know, normally, you get this the cap, don't you? The nose cone, if you like, is a separate piece. So then the uh, props are a, a sort of a separate, separate yeah. single piece. Thing. Because obviously, like the spinner and propeller are new, ninety percent of the time. I can probably say, I don't know where I got that number from, but um, they're normally different colours. So. Obviously, from an enthusiast point of view, it's easier if they were separate parts. Yeah. Um, but for a starter set, it's perfectly fine. But now these, I mean, I've put I've put all these together, and they're they're great fun to, you know, if you just need something want something quick and satisfying to do, you can just, you know, pretty much half hour an hour, you can have all your major bits together, and then you can just sit and paint away, you know. Yeah. So. You know, for anyone who's returning to the hobby, you've lost a bit of confidence, or even, you know, you could if you've got a, a weekend away somewhere, just stick one in your suitcase and yeah, you, you only need you yeah. So that that brings us really nicely, Matt. Thank <laughs> you very much for that. On to the instructions. Yes. Um, but before I go to the instructions, mm. you mentioned part count. So what is the difference in part count on Spitfire? Do you know that off the top of your head? Because if you don't, I've written it down. Oh, I should have. I should have, I should have had this. I should have had this ready. Um, it's probably more than double. There's 26 parts to the uh, Spitfire starter set. Mm -hmm. That includes two parts for the the uh, stand. The stand. Yeah. Uh, then there's 73 parts to the classic kit. Yeah. It's quite a few more parts, yeah. considering that you know what you just said. Once they're built and next to each other, you can hardly tell the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess it's that's down to the modeler and what they're trying to get out of it. So, um, and that's you know all the little fiddly parts that you know the, the tail wheel. Well, that doesn't exist. That's part of what it does exist, but it's part of the main fuselage, isn't it? You know that interior detail. The canopy is one piece instead of the separate pieces that you get with it as well. So, um, so yeah, more than double. Yeah, which is impressive yeah. for a seventy-second scale kit mm. of the same aircraft. Yeah. Right. Instructions. Instructions. 
Yeah, spent a lot of time refining what we what we were doing with the instructions. So, you know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, do you want to talk us through this this map? Yeah, so kind of realised that if someone come in picking up a model kit for the first time, they might not have anyone around them that's had any experience of putting model kit together. Um, I know possibly our generation, uh, sort of our parents, grandparents grew up building models. Um, so what we've done is literally put together a step-by-step -step guide explaining the basics. So like how to remove the parts from the frame, um, how to apply the glue, um, how to deal with seams, like with files and things. Um, so literally step-by-step, -step, the kind of um, the tools and techniques that you're going to be... It's a bit of a cheat sheet, isn't it? Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. cheat sheet. Um, little little things that, um, you know, may have taken us six months to sort of pick up for our, our, our parents or, or on YouTube or, or whatever, but it's included in every single one of our starter sets now, this yeah. sheet, isn't it? Yeah. And one of the, the other... Um, things that I really like about this is whilst we include the paints, glues, brushes and you know plastic and, and of course our decals, um, you still need to go and buy tools. So um, but you don't need you don't need many, do no, you? Not so at all. and you know most of this stuff you'll have lying around the house anyway. So a, a nail file, you know, we might have one of those nicking yeah. um, around the house, go and go and nick one. Um, some tweezers. Some scissors, well, you know, everyone's got a kitchen, so you've got some scissors. Some clippers, you might have to go and buy a, you know, a pair of clippers, but, you know, they're pretty inexpensive, aren't they? A small drill, which it isn't really needed that often, is it? In, in all, no. in and, all fairness. And particularly in, the, in these kits, we've designed, some, designed them so you probably won't need yeah. a drill. And uh, then, uh, a, a, you know, a, a clothes peg. Yeah. Which is great because instead of trying to find some little G clamps or, or something, you know, you're gonna have yeah. clo yeah. clothes pegs around the house. Yeah, so. to be honest, I still say clothes peg is probably the best one of the best tools I've, yeah, been, we, I've been building for like them. ten years and yeah. I was like clothes Especially pegs the ones with the little rubber, rubber pads grip. on yeah. them. They're brilliant. Yeah. They don't slip <laughs> off. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I mean I've been using clothes pegs for about ten years now and I've got like maybe like twenty, thirty of them just so I can crap on and do multiple stuff at the same time. But yeah, clothes pegs, you know, just go out in the garden and Take some of the washing. Not with the clothes on, <laughs> so the clothes go flying off or something. Like yeah, that. don't leave all the washing in the mask. Yeah, <laughs> your neighbour's going. Where are all my clothes pegs gone? <laughs> Have I got paint on them? Yeah. Um, so that that one sheet is uh, a great benefit to starter sets, and I know, I know this isn't something that we're adding to our classic kits because the idea is by the time you get to our classic kits, of course, um, you would hopefully, hopefully send this as a starter set and start to pick those those uh, little tips and tricks up. And then the actual instruction sheet is a little bit different as well, isn't it? Yeah, so we've got some big ones, so we can see it on the camera a little bit more easily. Down here. Um, so one of the things we're doing is um, showing um, in colour where to apply the paint. Um, so what you see on the instructions should be exactly what you've got in front of you on your on your in your workspace. Um, we're showing you exactly where to apply the glue so you don't end up in a big sticky mess. Um, and up here, we've got a almost like a silhouette of what exactly what the parts look like on the frames, um, so that you can find the parts more easily. And after each step, we take we've taken away the parts that you've used, um, so what is shown here should be exactly what um, is on the desk in front of you. Try and make it as simple as possible and, and we're highlighting the parts that you need at each stage with the numbers. Um, I really like this because I've seen I've seen people at making paint events where they, they get the kit. Obviously it's their first time with their children quite often doing it. It's the adult yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on. And uh, they'll be like, right, okay, well, I give them a pair of cutters. And they, the first thing they do is, before they've looked at the instruction sheet, is they sit there and they cut every single piece off. Yes. So they've now not lost all the numbers that are attached to the part on the sprue. Yeah. And they go, oh, where do I go now? So having that on there is basically saying, that don't cut this off yet. You know, don't click, um, cut it off the frame. Wait yeah. until this part here. Yeah. Um, 
one nice thing about it as well is that if you show it up, like, yeah, is it. that um, Matt was saying is that the part actually disappears as well yeah. as you move on to the steps, yeah. which is quite an underrated thing because it's almost like real time. Yeah, yeah, I really when, like that. I mean, you're left down here with two, two tiny yeah. little parts. Yeah, I believe uh, that was Matt's idea as well, like to do that whole idea of having like the silhouette and obviously the part being removed once you remove moved it so literally the frame is looking like how you, it looks like on the instructions yeah i mean that's yeah. such a small little thing but it just has so much impact yeah um, and then each each stage is actually split into two so you've got the image of how the parts go together and an Im image of what you're hopefully going to end up with so after each stage you can see what you're aiming for um and it also helps so that we've um uh, with some models, it really helps to paint it as you go along rather than painting it at the end, especially like somewhere with an interior. You've got to pa paint the interior before you Put the glue the body shell yeah. on. So with the, with the colours being shown, we can we can show at what stage would work best to, to paint each part. Yeah, I really like the fact that we highlight in blue where the glue needs to go. Yeah, because unless you are you know, an, an experienced model or have done a, a, a couple, you've got a couple under your belt, you might not know perhaps to dry fit it first or where yeah. to apply the glue. So you might just end up squeezing that tube all over the wheel. Yeah. And then go, oh, I've just ruined it now because it, the whole thing started to melt on me. But yeah. um, so just seeing, you know, just to, to apply it on the outside of the alloy uh, or the inside of the rubber, as it were, uh, is really helpful. You don't yeah. go over the top of the glue. Yeah, another another thing we've done slightly differently on these is um, the part numbers on the frames are actually done in order. So you literally start with part number one and glue it to part number two and carry on all the way through um, the kit. Two of you as we parts up. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so even if you don't have the instructions in front of you, you can still work out how to put it together just by looking at the numbers on the, on the frames. I've seen some people saying, well, why don't you do this on your classic kits? I guess the answer to that is it would be a mammoth task. Yeah, especially when you start getting a two, three hundred part kit that's got loads of different build options and different weapons and there's versions that are going to come out in the future and things yeah, like that. It starts to get a bit... Parts 40 to 60 don't exist. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, not in that box they don't, but they might be coming down <laughs> at a later stage. Yeah, because we uh, we do that for the cars, but like for the aircraft and stuff like that, can't really. Do, it's hard to do that because you've got the options of uh, landing gear down and landing gear up. So it's literally touching what Matt's saying as well is that although um, it depends on how like simple the kit is or how straightforward it is, because there's no options on a, a car, isn't it? You can't have exactly like doors out or um, wheels off or something like that. It's just like that's how the car is. Yeah. Uh, whereas aircraft is like a slightly different um, approach. Tanks are obviously a lot like that as well, where you can just do it as one. The Mary Rose is not like um, any other optional. No, there's uh, only one Mary Rose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah there's only no, only one way to do the kit. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. I mean, yeah, that we were doing something like that. Yeah. Okay. You, Matt, you mentioned um, you, we've we've talked about these and we we've said beginner of all ages, and you, you touched on it, Matt, as, as a bit of a um, a project that will bring your modelling mojo back, which yeah. is a term that's used quite a lot at the moment on YouTube channels. Yeah, is is modelling mojo because um, you know I, I can only imagine if you're trying to build this massive kit that you've been on for two months that you've always wanted to do. It's not that you regret doing it, but you've been doing the same thing for two months. You need a break from it. Yeah. But your hobby is modeling. So you don't want to hate your hobby, of course. Mm. Um, that would defeat our business. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but you, you just need to come away from it a, a little bit. And I guess that's one of the things that you guys do upstairs with a CAD and working on projects. So you yeah. get so far and then like, no. Yeah. I know Matt, you're not a fan of the 124, designing a 124 scale kit. Yeah, I haven't got the, uh, I don't think I could stay motivated <laughs> long enough. But it's the same with, you know, building one. You know, if you've been building a huge project where you've you've glued together a hundred parts and you're still on the cockpit, yeah. you know, but you just want to 
stick some parts together so you can get the airbrush out and free hands and camouflage or you want to stick a tank together so you can try out some weathering techniques These or are perfect. Just make a little diorama with your you know it's um they're, they're great fun little kits yeah and, uh, it's, it's worth just put it putting one together just to to have a go for, with different techniques and so i've used them as a bit of blank tank canvas to try some new new ideas or yeah. Yeah. Weapon techniques and things. just you know bring your modeling bro mojo mm. back up and then uh, you know build a build a kit or two experiment doesn't matter if you mess it up um, and then you can go back to your larger larger projects and i imagine there's you know i know our biggest market is certainly aircraft um but um perhaps you've you've modeled second world war aircraft for for years, you've never got into the car market mm. because you, you know, trying to get gloss paint, you know, absolutely perfect mm. is a is an art itself, isn't it? Definitely, you know? yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, perhaps with a camo, it's a bit, it's, it's a very freehand, just like like it was in the in the real day. Mm. Um, so going onto a small car just to try and perfect the paint is. It's a good yeah. little thing to have, and, and certainly like the, the little Pagani, this mm. this one here, um, I made that just over a couple of lunch times, um, just um, and literally it was just a, a hump roll spray can of um, metallic blue, and then I brush painted the rest of it just with gold and black, um, and then probably within sort of two hours, less than three hours, I've got a little finished model yeah. that I was really pleased with. So. So you just you painted the whole interior, well spray spray painted it black. Yeah. And then the painted body the shirt. body blue, picked out a couple of little details with the gold paint, and uh, there you go. Yeah, the brake calipers are are in there. Little red, little bit of red paint for the brake calipers, yeah. which I saw on the instruction sheet for the Bugatti. Of course, you can you paint that before you put the wheel the wheel hub over. Yeah. Which is yeah. pretty important for a forty third scale. Yeah, we're a bit tricky painting it through the through the <laughs> space. <laughs> like cleaning cleaning the car wheels, which uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, some people love doing, but uh, I must admit it's not the most enjoyable thing I find about cleaning a car. So yeah, the perfect little mojo lifters um, for regardless of what sort of subject you're into. Uh, you know, maybe you've never made a little galleon ship or something, and mm. and that would be ideal to just go off and do something a little bit different. To be honest, I think like. Um, maybe in the past like five or ten years but these like enthusiast model makers would shy away from starter sets just because they're thinking they want something a bit more complicated yeah. or the starter set is too simple but like I was saying is that you can't barely tell the difference between uh, that starter set Spitfire and a classic Spitfire once it's done yeah it's only the only difference is like the build process and the journey to it um, and I think sometimes that can put off enthusiasts but I've got to say that these are like a completely different breed of starter sets um, they're really simple they're really good mojo builders and after like even when you're as Matt was saying is that if you're like doing something big and you're like in the cockpit and you're sort of mojo is waning a bit like these are brilliant just to like pick it up again so that you can go back onto your main project or your bigger project yeah. as a um, little like a mojo yeah yeah uh, builder I don't personally but I uh, a couple of months ago I started to build one of the 35th scale tanks in the range and uh, I was like, right, you know, wife's away this weekend. I know what I'll do. I'll do a bit of modelling. And, um, you know, I started, I was sat there watching um, Ice Cold and Alex, mm -hmm. actually. I'd never seen the film before, and I thought, right. oh, given uh, a couple of product releases, I thought I'd better, better go and watch that. So I sat there watching that um, and, and, and building the um, Brumbar, and, uh, which has just been, been released. And I've, I've still not finished it. Mm. And I was working on it over over both days at the weekend and um, I've still not finished it and I've not found the time to go back. I remember that weekend when and, you were telling me that you were building that yeah. and I've, I've just not found the time to go back and it's not an overly complicated vehicle in terms of its shape or anything. You know, I've, I had those two days to, to build something and actually on the, on the Sunday I found it quite frustrating that I'd only got that far. It sort of had the opposite effect of what I wanted mm. To fill at the on that Sunday, um, actually tell a lie. I've had one day since where I um, I, I took a Sherman Firefly home, and um, Friday afternoon, and um, built it on a Friday afternoon, sprayed it on a Saturday, nice. um, and did a bit of detailing in the afternoon, and applied decals, and and I was like, job, job done, mm. you know. And I thought, well, why didn't I do that before instead of trying to go some yeah. massive? 
Yeah, you well, know, there's definitely a lot to be said for for just little simple kits that you can just keep your motivation going. Yeah, and the cool little dioramas you can do with these vehicles, mm. including the the cars, but the you know the the fly fly and the um, the the Tiger One, the yeah you know, the little dioramas you can get out of that would be uh, pretty cool yeah, to see. Fun. Yeah, go and get some little twigs from the garden and start loading up all over the place. That'd be uh, <laughs> that'd be cool, and you know, pretty pretty cheap to do. Cool. Okay. Anything else that I've missed off, or you guys think that um, we should really cover off with starter sets? One thing that was pretty cool, you sort of touched on it, is that when you were doing shows, is you said that um, sometimes the kids would just cut off all the parts of the sprue. Mm. And I remember, so I started in September 2018 and didn't really do, wasn't involved in the make and paint section at Telford at that time that year. Um, but the year after that, we done RIA in 2019. And that was like a huge eye opener for me because that's the um, show that you don't get um, kids who are uh, know anything about the hobby. It's, like it's more of a family show than it is. A, it's, exactly. It's a family show, not a modeling show. Yeah. yeah. And I remember um obviously with the team and everything like that and i remember looking after um some make and paint i remember daryl came up coming up to me goes can you um look after this group of children and i remember i was looking after two and then another one came and another one came and another one came and i was like whoa but it was just it, from a design point of view it was a big eye opener for me um to understand what works what doesn't work and then um, what doesn't work, how to improve that in future designs because um, as you guys know it's not announced yet but um, for next year uh, starts, the starter set range is being obviously expanded. Um, so not going to tell them that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's like the starter set range is being added. It's not going to stop here. Yeah. Um, it's something that we're investing in um, sort of medium term, yeah. well, long term, of course, but in, in terms of getting the the range back up to speed yeah. and and you know the the, the quality and um, the mindset that we have here is really important that we focus a little bit more time on it. But so. those lessons learned at that React show and uh, in Telford later that year, which actually was the last Telford that we'd done before um, lockdown and everything, which yeah. was in twenty nineteen. That was the year that we announced the Vulcan. Those were like really big eye openers because obviously doing a start set fairly recently, applying those um, ideas that I had in my head back then now really helps. And obviously understanding that and obviously producing a better product. I mean, like these products are just going to evolve, evolve yeah, yeah. till they're close to perfection. Yeah. I mean, like that's the ideal thing. But it's just one of those ones from a design point of view. I was like, wow, that was a big eye opener for me, understanding how kids work and how their minds work. Mm. Um, it's but there's also a massive uh, difference between the kids at Ria and the kids at Telford. Kids at Telford, obviously, their parents are obviously they're only going to that show because they're, they're models. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're a lot more skilled and don't need as much help. So, but they still sh struggle with the kits that we had. But then that's the whole point of this um, starter set range. Yeah. I mean, when we done it in 2019, the, I can't remember now whether or not the kits were announced at that point. I don't think they were. But it, in my head, I already knew that they were coming, and I was like this is going to be so much more better yeah. and a much more better experience for the kids. I mean, like one of those things is that if the kid or any adult or whatever um, does a kit and it's not great, it puts them off the hobby. Yeah. And we've, so, lo and we've lost a person. So it's, it's all about, for, for me, and, and you know, um, being head of brand, it's, it's all about ensuring that that the product is the best it can be for the target audience. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it wasn't, it was, yeah. It was intended for a uh, a more experienced modeler. It's not great. So now we have that product. And uh, then um, the the second thing we need to achieve now is is having those controlled environments and getting back out into the shows this year, which we can do, is 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 one element that we're we're looking at, and we're looking at a number of other um, activities there that we can we can. Do modeling in more of a controlled environment mm. uh, and YouTube uh, channel um, videos and bits and pieces that we can that we can do. So sort of really will elaborate on the instruction guides that um, you know you guys have already worked on. And um, Rich Richie Pets upstairs yeah. just scratches his head on and, and does a fantastic job. Um, so um, one last thing before we we close the video, and it's not really related to starter sets, 
But I guess it's, it's, it's the question that keeps on being asked, and I've just seen the logo on the on the frame here, is can I recycle the plastic? Um, yeah, the plastic we use is um, high impact polystyrene, um, and it can it's a um, it's a thermoplastic, so it can be recycled. Um, obviously, what your local council provides um, might differ from area to area, but we've put the um, the resin identifier on the on the sprues um, yeah. on the frames rather, so that we can so that you can identify what type of plastic it is for recycling. Yeah, yeah. perfect. I know we keep on the uh, it's obviously a, uh, a hot topic and quite rightly so recycling and um, and uh, we, we quite often receive messages on social media or or, uh, or email. Can I recycle this plastic? Can I send it back to you for you to recycle? Well, no, you can't do that, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, you know, being able to recycle it through your normal household bins is uh, is, is pretty yeah. pretty uh, in, important to do. So so make sure you do that. Yeah, back at home we've got boxes. So every now and again, I have a whole box full. Yeah, we got a recycling box full. Of you have to be a bit careful about the uh, the, the frames that sort of you're uh, binning. Oh, because no, you're quite often working on projects that haven't been announced yet. So uh, yeah, yeah, now everyone's going to be rummaging through my bins. <laughs> Where does Paramjit live? Let's go through his bins. <laughs> Particularly large fox. <laughs> Uh, brilliant guys thank you so much for coming in today I know it's your first sprue talk um, albeit the live last week um, really interesting to understand um, how the starter sets and, and classics um, um, differ and, and, and why um, so um, thank you thanks for uh, having me yeah, pleasure pleasure <laughs> hopefully you'll come back down again soon um, bring donuts next time Pound I ate them on the way. Oh, no, I know you did. You actually <laughs> took my fob and went back up and had a donut before we started rolling. Um, so hopefully you've enjoyed this. Uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video and comment and subscribe. Um, if you haven't seen a, a previous Sprue Talk, go and check out the playlist um, and check out the uh, Sprue Talk Live uh, that uh, me and Matt did with a number of others last week, which was good fun. We should do some more of those. Yeah. Get some That's pieces good. in again. Yeah, more. Um, more of a certain brand of pizza. <laughs> More of a, another certain brand of pizza who haven't sponsored us, so uh, we won't mention their name anymore. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you again. Thank Thanks, you. Dale. Thanks for staying with us, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much. <laughs>